If you're like me, you grew up in an era where there were plenty of fantasy films uh, produced by cartoon companies that would uh, show a princess in a castle uh, being saved by a prince. And then as you get a little bit older, there are teen dramas that depict uh, children in high school dating each other having romances and all types of entanglements and all types of exciting drama. And then as you get older, there is rom-coms, romantic comedies and lifetime movies that again, depict this, this concept of love, that love is a completion of a person. If they are to get into a relationship, if they are to be saved by a prince, if they are to run into their high school sweetheart, they will finally find the thing that they have been missing in their life as long as they've been living, the one thing they were looking for, the one thing that will complete them, the one thing that will make them happy, and that is love, romantic love. But is this really reality? Is it just, we just need to meet the right person and everything else is gonna fall into place? Well, of course, those of us uh, who have had an opportunity, many opportunities even, uh, to have relationships have found that uh, when we are survivors of trauma, just simply meeting someone who seems to be right doesn't uh, cure, cure us from our pain. It doesn't cure us from our loneliness. It doesn't cure us from our codependency. As a survivor of trauma, a romantic relationship may actually exacerbate the feelings of pain, the feelings of loneliness, the feelings of codependency. Ultimately, all of the pain that we were hoping to run from, everything that we were seeking in a romantic relationship, we may find is actually lacking because we've never healed the hole in ourselves. The reason you should not be dating is because you are not healed yet. Now, of course, if you are already healed from your complex trauma, which is very possible to do, then there is no objection to go on and continue to pursue relationships, be that uh, just friendships or romantic relationships. Uh, but recognize that first... Before you pursue romantic relationships, you need to make sure you have healed yourself so that you're coming to these rom ro relationships as a whole, complete person and not a broken, fragmented person who's in desperation, uh, who can't stand the idea of being alone. That very, that very concept, if we just can't handle the idea that we would be alone, that gives us the suggestion that maybe it's too soon. Maybe we're not ready uh, to get into a relationship. And so we shouldn't pr pursue a romantic relationship if we have not healed our childhood wounds. So how do we know if we're ready? Well, if you fear abandonment, then you're not ready. Because if, you, if you're having a fear of abandonment and then you're pursuing a relationship, you may be attracted to emotionally unavailable partners, see, because they can never fully abandon you because they're already not there, because they're already in a marriage, they're already in a relationship, they already live on the other side of the world, the country, they're, they're somehow unavailable. And so that's what makes you want to pursue them. And so that would be already setting yourself up for failure in your relationship. Recognize you're not ready yet, if you're still having a fear of abandonment. Or for instance, if you're still having trust issues, well, then you wouldn't want to get into a relationship because then you're going to come in and bring in and project your trust issues onto the next relationship and project your trust issues onto that person. So if you're jumping into a relationship and you have trust issues, you could become paranoid or you could become controlling or you could become accusatory or you could become demanding. All right, where were you? What are you doing? Who? Why? What? What is this? I just saw a video on social media. A man barges in the gym, and and his uh, his girl was 
getting a lesson from a personal trainer. And he goes in, he starts yelling at the personal trainer, what is this? What is this? It was just a normal training lesson. The man had never healed his trust issues. So now he's going and projecting all of, all of these concerns, all of these issues onto his girlfriend and her trainer. Too soon. He should not be dating. Now, if you're already in a marriage, you don't need to leave your marriage to go work on yourself. The problem is many people are uh, jumping into romantic obsession, looking for their savior. And they jump from a romantic obsession to a romantic obsession. And so the feelings that they're having when they're getting into these romantic obsessions feels like love, but really it's limerence. Do you know what limerence is? Limerence is the state of being infatuated or obsessed with another person. The state of being infatuated or obsessed with another person. Typically uh, experiencing involuntary obsession characterized by strong desire for or reciprocation of one's feelings but not primarily for a sexual relationship, then that would be like lusts. But limerence is just like a, usually a romantic obsession uh, with, a, with a person, All right? So when people have limerence, an obsession over someone, usually it's with someone they're not with or they're in the relationship with them. So many people fall in love with uh, people that they're at work with, people who they work for, people that they see on television. And embarrassingly enough, we could not even necessarily know uh, the person that we're falling in love with. It's just that we've had some interaction or we've seen them. It could be a movie star, it could be a singer, and we're falling into limerence with these people. And so limerence is this infatuation, this obsession uh, some people also uh, find themselves falling in love with their therapists. And so uh, this uh, situation where you're actually falling in love with your own therapist is called transference. Transference occurs when a client unconsciously projects feelings about someone else onto their therapist. So what can we do if we find ourselves experiencing transference? We find ourselves falling in love with our therapist or feeling like we're having feelings for our therapist. We should recognize that this is not uncommon. This is actually quite common because in the therapeutic relationship, there's all types of connection. There's emotional bonding that's happening. And when someone's treating you well and you're idealizing a person to be perfect, uh, it can be quite natural for you to start to develop feelings for them and start to uh, think about them or associate them with either perfection or idealize them or think of them even as being like, maybe they're the person that I've been looking for. Uh, but again, in this situation, this is just another form of limerence. It is not actual love. And so we can express to our therapists exactly what's going on. We can do research on transference. And we can work through the situation without having to completely stop our therapy uh, because it's important for us to stick through and heal. And this is a part of the healing process to go through and, and, and find our way through and navigate through uh, these difficult feelings and these difficult emotions uh, that can come up uh, through the process. What can we do if we, can, if we recognize that in our case, we are not ready to start dating? So if we recognize we're not ready to start dating, we need to stop dating and we need to go through the healing process. Well, how long does that take? Well, if you're, go if you're in my program, you can go through the healing process relatively quickly. So this could be simply just a matter of months that you go through the healing process.
It could be as little as 12 to 16 weeks that you go through the healing process. So it doesn't have to be years and years of healing, but it's in, it's important that you uh, go through that process before you get in to trying to find a romantic relationship. Because trying to find a romantic relationship before you're healed is going to lead to you possibly getting hurt yourself worse or attracting the wrong person who's going to hurt you or hurting someone else. If we want to stop the cycle of abuse that's been going through our family for generations, it starts by applying this information right here. If we've gone through the healing process and we are ready to start to, to, to find another person, you should still stop dating and instead you should start vetting. We want you to stop dating and instead start vetting when it comes to finding a life partner. So what does that mean exactly? Well, this concept of vetting means to scrutinize uh, with criticism, to make a careful and critical examination of. That's what we want to do when it comes to finding a life partner. We need to scrutinize. Don't date, vet. The problem with dating in our modern society is the concept of dating has become a leisure activity. Dating is getting together to socialize with the person whom you have romantic interest in. But when it's turned into a leisure activity, many people have the wrong viewpoint of what dating is and what the purpose of dating is. And so they say, well, I'm bored, so I will go on some dates. Or I'm feeling lonely, so I decided to go on a dating app, start scrolling through and find someone that I could date. Well, why are you dating? Are you ready? Well, I'm not really ready for anything serious right now. But I just thought this would be a good way to, to fill my time. It's just a way to pass time, right? They're taking a casual view to dating. But should dating be viewed as something that's casual? Should dating be viewed as entertainment? Something to tickle our fancy? Worse yet, some trauma survivors, when they find themselves at the end of one relationship, quickly try to put a Band-Aid on it in the form of another human being. So again, they jump onto the dating apps and they start scrolling through and then they find uh, somebody and then they go and they get this person in their bedroom and then they start actually having sex with the person that they barely know. They've only known them one day, five days, a week, and already... They're in a sexual relationship with this person. Now, why is that? Is this because this is for their forever person? No, they just wanted a bed buddy so that they wouldn't have to feel the feelings of being alone. This isn't healthy. And this is not the proper way to view dating. Dating has a purpose. And if we don't date with a purpose, which is to find our forever partner, we will find ourselves meandering and searching through life, falling and stumbling into holes, and making mistakes. So we need to stop dating and start vetting, understanding that if you're going out to try to use dating as entertainment, then you're actually being insensitive and you're wasting time. You're being insensitive to other people. You're being insensitive to yourself because dating as entertainment means that you're leading just to somebody has to get hurt. Oh, whoever puts their feelings in, that's the person who gets hurt. That's insensitive. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to be with this person. I'm going to spend time with them, but I'm not going to actually love them. I'm not going to actually give any feelings to them. That's insensitive. And you're wasting your time. You're wasting the other person's time as well. Because if ultimately what you wanted was to find a forever partner, casual dating is not the way to do it. It's dangerous also. You see, meeting people 
And then spending copious amounts of time with them can lead to you developing romantic feelings for them, but they may not be qualified to be your forever mate. So you could be going out and developing feelings for people who would never actually meet your qualifications if you had vetted them. Further, spending the copious amounts of time together can lead to unwanted pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, and almost always at the end of it, heartbreak. Imagine being in a relationship for several months, for several years, only to realize that the person doesn't share your views on religion, politics, having children. And now you're faced with a dilemma because you realize this person is not qualified to be your forever mate, but you've already invested so much time and so much energy. And then you're faced with the concept of the sunken cost fallacy, which is where we feel like we've put so much time into something that we can't let it go. It's the sunken cost. We've, we've spent so much that we, can, we can't walk away from it now even though it's not right, then we should walk away. The problem is we should have walk, walked away before we spent so much of ourselves on this relationship. The way we avoid this is by not dating around, but instead vetting. If you're going to date a person, ideally you would only date your forever person or someone who definitely qualifies to be so. But how do we do this? How do we find, how do we, how do we vet to make sure that we find our forever person if we don't date? Don't we have to date in order to find our forever person? Look at the way a company is run. If a company needs to hire a new CEO to run the company or it needs to hire a new employee, do they just hire people? who may or may not be qualified, let them sit in the position for a while. And then after some indefinite amount of time, do some sort of messy breakup with that employee or CEO. No, a company will thoroughly vet the person before they hire them for the position because it would be a waste of time and resources to bring someone on who is not actually qualified for the job. They won't give anyone that special position until they've thoroughly vetted them. That is to scrutinize, to criticize, to, to critically examine the person first to, to, uh, to make sure that they're qualified for the position before actually taking the risk and putting them in that position. We must do the same thing with the position that we are filling in our life. So if you're deciding that, that you are healed and you are looking for that forever person, then you need to go through that vetting process. So how do we do that? As soon as you, you meet someone, this can be at work, at school, this could be online, it could be through friends, through mutual friends. And there's any potential that there might be some put down the line romantic interest in this person, you need to immediately put them in the friend zone. That's the first thing you need to do to make sure you're you're not dating, but you're vetting. So, so it's not, hey, I like this person. I'm going to ask them on a date. No, wrong. Cross that off your, 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 your list. That's not how it goes. Or this person likes me, they asked me on a date. Say no. I'm sorry. I don't know you. We need to get to know each other before I would go out with you or go on a date. That's the proper response. If you're the pursuer in the relationship, then instead of going out on a date with a person or initiating a date with a person, you will initiate a vetting process with the person. So either way, whether you're being pursued, you say, oh, I'm going to need to vet you first. Or if you're the pursuer, then you say, oh, before I go and go hard and start getting this time together, I'm going to start vetting this person. So through text message, email, letter, and telephone from a reasonably safe distance or out in public with groups of people, 
before you can create a situation where there will be romantic interest, you need to go through a very stringent process of checking their qualifications. In order to do this, you must first have an idea of what your deal breakers are. So think now, before you meet these people, ask yourself, what are my deal breakers? What are some things that can happen down the line that could that could make me have to break up with this person if I found them out later down the line? And that's how you know what qualifications you're looking for from the very beginning. Write them down on a piece of paper. Make sure you know what your deal breakers are. In this vetting process, this is before you have done any dating. Do not be flirtatious in your in your exchanges. Do not be too exclusive. Do not be texting all day and night. Limit or rather even eliminate fantasizing. No magical thinking. The magical thinking is the creating the fantasy and creating the limerence for the person that leads you into the world of pain and trouble. No magical thinking. What you're doing is just figuring out, okay, within these boundaries of you being just a friend, just an, an associate right now, I want to find out more about you. What are some of the things that you're going to want to know? What are their religious beliefs? Do they practice their religion? Or are they non-practicing? How zealous are they about these, these beliefs that they have? What are their political views? How zealous are they about their political views? What are their views on social issues? Things like abortion, the environment. Do they want to have children? Or do they not want to have children? What are their reasons? Are they looking for a forever mate? Or are they looking to date casually? Are they ready to get married? Who do they believe should provide financially in the relationship? What do they believe are the roles in the relationship? Most important question. Most important question in your vetting process. This is the one that you should obsess over early on. What are their flaws? What are the person's flaws? Ask them directly. Tell me what your flaws are. Then ask them, what do other people say your flaws are? What do other people argue or uh, complain about, about you? What happened to your past relationships? Are you working to overcome some of your flaws? What work are you doing? Do you believe in therapy? How is your mental health? Have you been diagnosed with anything? This is texting, email, letter, maybe a phone call. <laughs> maybe talking in a in a group environment this is before going on any dates this is before inviting them or accepting their invite on a date you are asking them questions like this how's your relationship with your parents how's your parents relationship with each other how's your relationship with your siblings If possible, uh, what is your sexual history? And, and if possible, were they abused? What is their relationship with violence? Have they ever killed someone? Have they ever wanted to kill someone? 
How do they handle that? It seemed like some pretty crazy questions to ask a person, right? These are the best questions you can possibly ask a person. These are the best questions. We need to find these things out early on. We need to find these things out early on in a relationship. So before we get our feelings involved, you see, we're putting our head into it before we put our heart into it. Can you see how this information would empower you to make very good decisions early on? So because it's very easy to break up a relationship that's only one week old, two weeks old, three weeks old, than it is to break up a three-year relationship. That's so hard, right? So, so we're making it a lot easier on ourselves to, to be asking these questions through a process of texting them early on in the relationship or messaging them or speaking to them out in public in a group environment. We need to find these things out early on. It's okay to ask around about them as well, to, to, uh, to cooperate their answers. It's early on, that's the thing to do. Right. It gets weirder if you start doing that later in the relationship. You start asking other people about this person. That gets weird to do. We want to have deep conversations with these people about personal issues and things right away before we get involved in in a whole romance with the person. If you find out after you've gone through everything that they're probably not qualified to be your forever mate, just simply terminate the relationship. Or if they're not dangerous, then you might leave them there just as a friend. But if there was any initial attraction, it might be better to actually pull back so that you don't act, end up slipping into a relationship with this person there where there's some attraction, but they're not that perfect forever mate that you're looking for. And I use the word perfect loosely because obviously we're not looking for a perfect person, but we're looking for a, an adequate match to, to our qualifications. Uh, If there's some things it's kind of in between, like they, there's some things where you're concerned about it, but, but for the most part, they do match up with what you're looking for. Then, then inform them of your concerns. Now is the time to have tough discussions and fights. Five days into the relationship. This is when we want to be in a in a disagreement with the person. It seems crazy, like <laughs> arguing with a person that we barely know. Yeah, now's the time to debate things and, and kind of work out these things. You're going to feel a lot stronger and, and, and ready to do this earlier in a relationship than you're going to feel later in a relationship when you're afraid of losing them, right? So, so you're in your power position early on to, to do this vetting process. It's okay to, to uh, take your, the answers to your questions and take them to a trusted advisor like your, your therapist, your coach, and get their input. Uh, but remember, you're the queen, you're the king. You need to make the decision. You need to do the vetting process, and you need to decide if someone's going to be right for you. Because we're talking about your time, your energy, your resources, your body that you're going to be putting into this relationship. So you got to make sure it's going to be a a sound investment. So what's the next step? If if we find out that, that they do qualify, they've done their work, they're healed. We've done our work, we're healed, and they're meeting the qualifications, then go ahead and move forward and begin to court with with a view to marriage. You shouldn't attempt to linger in the courting, dating process. You should lay a timeline early on. A timeline early on. Now is the time for extreme caution. So you're, you're going to discuss with each other, you know, when do you think you would like to see marriage come into the picture and this and that kids and all you create timelines, how long before we were to get engaged, do you think? And and how long, do, and you work it out together. You give your input too. 
well, in my opinion, I think this and that. And you come to an agreement on a general timeline right in the beginning of the dating process. And then in the dating process, you can continue your observations of the person and getting to know them. But now you're, you're getting to know them a little more closely. So you can examine the way that they uh, speak to their parents, right? Some red flags are if they're speaking disrespectfully to parents um, and other close relatives, that's a red flag. If there's enmeshment in their, in their family, between them and their family, their family of origin, that's a red flag, something to be concerned about. It could cause problems down the line. A good, a good thing you can do where you can get a really comprehensive list of red flags is to use the toxic family guide, uh, the toxic family dynamics guide, which is right on the top of the website, mindfree.org. It's a free ebook. You just click it, download it, open it up, and it has alphabetized all of these behaviors that are toxic. And you can start looking in this person for those toxic behaviors. And if you're seeing these behaviors, then again, these are red flags, which are red lights. That means stop, stop the, stop the process with them. Pay attention to the stories about their exes. Look for the common, the common theme. But once you're dating, immediately define every step, right? Because many people have the experience and the, the very painful experience of being in a relationship, but feeling like they don't know what the relationship is, like, what are we? Like, what is this, right? Very important to define every step, okay? And a lot of people will try to especially narcissistic, egopathic abusers will will try to, to get you to be happy with the relationship without a definition, uh, a title on every step. So say, ah, don't put labels on it. It's like, hey, are we dating? Are we boyfriend, girlfriend? Ah, don't put labels on it, right? That's toxic. That's toxic. Put labels on it. <laughs> we need labels. Labels are good. That's organization right? You even label boxes in your closet. So why would you not label your relationship? You need to know what you're doing. Like, what are we doing here? Like, we need labels. So, so seek the labels very early in the relationship. Here's, here's four labels, four stages of, of a healthy dating relationship. Uh, stage number one would be the talking stage. This is we're getting to know each other as friends. We are not exclusive. We are just talking. We're just getting to know. This is also your vetting period, which you can continue to vet all the way up to the wedding, but this is your vetting period. Step number one, the getting to know or the talking phase, right? During this phase, boundaries, there should be no physical affection like kissing, have rules, have standards for yourself. This, If you're getting to know someone non-exclusively, you should not be kissing them. Why would you exchange saliva with the person you're getting to know? Set standards for yourself. Boundaries. Your boundaries early on, the more you show up as a boundary person, the, the faster you can recognize if they're a narcissist. It's your boundaries that expose if they're a narcissist. You set boundaries early on. They show respect for boundaries. That's a green flag. Oh, they respect my boundaries. That's a beautiful thing. They still love me despite boundaries. They don't get upset. As soon as you see that the boundaries are really, really tumultuous for them, they really have a hard time respecting you, bam, that's your, that's your red light. That's your red flag. Something wrong with this person. They don't, they don't respect boundaries. Step number two in a relationship is going to be the dating process, dating with a view to marriage, which means that now you are exclusive and now it would be appropriate to have displays of affection because just only you two, but it's dating with a view to marriage. So during this time period, you're already creating with this person a timeline for when we think engagement about should be happening and when we think marriage about should be happening. Don't let anyone waste your time. Do not let these men 
waste your time or women, whatever it is you're dealing with, don't let them waste your time. If they're not ready to get into a committed relationship, they're not ready to do something, then, 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 then they are not your forever mate, not right now. Timing is very huge in finding your forever partner. So step number two is dating with a view to marriage. The old-fashioned term for this is courtship. They understood at that time you are courting to get married. Like, yes, I'm. we're in this process to move towards marriage. So therefore, step number three is engagement. Put a ring on it. If you're the masculine in the relationship, it is your responsibility to initiate the definition of these stages. You're supposed to be progressing this relationship through these stages and defining it along the way. This is how you dignify the feminine. If you're the feminine in the relationship, you have the right to set ultimatums. So many times the feminine in the relationship will be, what are we? What is this? Can you just tell me what we are? Don't think you have no power. You are powerful too. You are an authority in this relationship too. You have the right to set ultimatums. This is what an ultimatum looks like. Hey, look, I can't waste time. I like you, but if you don't give me a definition of what we are, then I have to move on. That's an ultimatum. Look, I like you, but if I am not getting an engagement ring, (laughs) <laughs> within X amount of time, then I have to move on. You should be doing that as a feminine in the relationship. You should be setting the ultimatums. You should be making very clear what your desires are and what your wants are. What your desires and wants are. Because the masculine in the relationship will want to fulfill your desires and your wants within what's possible. This is motivating for for them. So it's your job as the masculine to define the relationship and solidify yourself as the leader by taking the steps, moving things forward, and and setting the, the parameters. Finally, the fourth, the fourth step after engagement is going to be marriage. You should not draw the engagement out. Set an ultimatum. If you're the feminine in the relationship, say, hey, I love you, but if we don't get married within a certain time frame here, I have to move on. This is not, what are we staying engaged for years? What is this? For what? It's reasonable that we would have an engagement process so that we would have time to make necessary arrangements, but don't base your entire relationship on setting a party. Like the wedding is just a party. Keep this, keep the wedding simple. Focus on the relationship. That's what's important. The marriage is important, not the wedding. Keep it simple. Something simple. Move forward, right? With the relationship. Following this pattern that I've set out today, uh, talking about dating, why you shouldn't be dating, how to vet, all of this will help you to break the cycle of abuse that has been in your family for generations, because this is what your parents failed to do. But you will not fail. You will be successful. If you have questions on this, you can contact me uh, through the website, mindfreed.org. And you can, I have a phone number on there. You can send text messages to me. 